Have your Bibles? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, find, if you will, um, verse 9. The Bible says in verse 9, let's go ahead and stand, if you would, as we, we do read these a couple of verses, just to show our respect for God's Word as we read to begin with, and we'll pray and then be seated in just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, it says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Notice it says, my grace is sufficient for thee. The title of the message this evening is The Place of Grace. The Place of Grace. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, would you please help us to access your grace? And Lord, tonight, work in our hearts and help, help us, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Help each one. And those that do not know Christ as Savior, help them to place their faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, help those that have already become uh, saved and have been uh, forgiven of their sins through faith in Christ. Lord, help them to see and every one of us to see our weakness so we can really uh, have your strength. I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for saying you may be seated. I had mentioned before that we are parked with our truck and trailer out at the um, recreational, uh, Chili Cathy Recreational and RV Center there. And uh, it's a really, really nice place to be able to be. Uh, and it's a unique place because it, there's not too many RV parks that actually we can fit in. And so we have a large Volvo truck full size semi and we pull a custom built uh, trailer 49 foot all total we are 75 feet long it's like a train going down going down the highway we are our family of six uh, lived in that full time we have no house this is our home all year round and uh, so um, our kids grew up and this is what they knew they loved it and it was, it was just absolutely fantastic well though with this trailer it's very not only big but it's very heavy. One particular church I was going to, the assistant pastor said, uh, we can't have you park on our main parking lot because there's too many, uh, too many cars. We don't have enough room, <clears throat> but we'll put you on the, our overflow parking lot. I said, no problem. He said, it's grass. I said, that's a problem. And uh, he said, no, 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 it's okay. You know, there's cars that go over all the time. I said, yeah, I know, but we're really heavy. He said, well, you know, and there's no, it's not on, it's not on the city, it's on city sewers, so there's no septic tanks or whatever. You shouldn't be, a, shouldn't have a problem. I said, I don't know. I was real hesitant. So we parked someplace else. We looked at it. I said, okay, I'll give it a try. So we got it there real close. We had to go from the road up and over a curb onto the grass. That I shouldn't have done it, but I did it. But the first uh, set of tires from the semi got up and over the curb onto the grass no problem and then it got to the back set there's it singled out a uh, tra truck and so uh, the back tires went up and over the curb and they're also on the grass and uh, then I slowly keep going onto the grass and finally the first set of tires uh, of my trailer get on there second set and three it's a triple axle and they get on the the grass as well I pull the air brakes on the truck and I go out and I check out the situation all seems good except when I was getting back in, I noticed the front left tire had sunk down about three inches. I go, oh, that's not good. I could tell it was like it got softer and softer and softer and it just sunk down. And so I said, um, let me back up. I backed up and it was solid behind it. I said, no, okay, let's just pack it back up and we'll park back here. He said, no, 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 the cords won't reach, the electrical won't reach, the hoses won't reach, it, it, it just won't work. Uh, just go, go forward and uh, just keep going and don't stop. Sounded like good advice. And so uh, uh, I said, okay. And uh, so I put it in gear. I released the clutch and I went as fast as I could on the grass. And that front tire did fine going over the soft spot. But that rear left tire of the truck with all that weight from the trailer on it sunk down all the way to the axle. It was completely sunk down as far as it could go. 20 some inches down. At the, those semi tires are huge. I just had some change. And they are just huge. And, uh, and there's 20 inches down. 
And I said, oh, wow, I have never been stuck like this before. The assistant pastor said, hey, do you want me to um, get the, the church bus and pull you out? I'm like, uh, no, I need help. I need professional help more ways than one. And uh, so I said, no, I need a tow truck and I need a big one. You know, don't get this little tow truck. I need this big semi tow truck. OK, well, we're calling places. Finally, an hour later, you got Watts stuck where? <laughs> Just come, you know, and. And uh, so they come with the semi tow truck, 80,000 pound truck. Man, this is impressive. It shows up, air brakes go off, door swings open, out comes the tow truck driver. You know, tow truck driver. Ripped up jeans, hoodie, sweatshirt, tough. Ding, you know, t you know, you know, and uh, so here the door swings open and out comes a tow truck driver and she was all of that. And let me tell you, she was tough. And uh, she came up to me. She said, got yourself stuck, didn't you? I said, yes, ma'am, I did. And she said, OK, here's what we'll do. And she, she mapped out a plan. I thought we'd disconnect the truck. She said, no, 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 we can't do that. Have to keep it connected. And uh, so um, and so I, I was going into like this curve, if you will. And um, and so she said, well, uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's just kind of pull you and uh, see if you can, can get up and uh, out of that. And so we'll just hook up the winch and everything to that. So, man, those, that big truck went down and went down into the ground, you know, several inches with those big uh, uh, legs or whatever. And uh, so it starts the winch, it starts pulling. Of course, I didn't have it in gear. I wasn't pressing the accelerator. I was just inside. She said, just kind of be there to make sure it's okay, steering and everything. And, uh, and I'll just keep going. Well, it, things are cracking and popping. It, we start moving and it goes two feet and it's not coming out. It's just digging a trench. It goes three feet. It goes four feet. It's just piling up dirt underneath. I said, whoa, 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 stop, stop. And things are like bending and breaking underneath. I, I, at least it looked like it. And uh, so I said, what's going on? She said, well, we just got to keep going. Let's, let's dig this out, this dirt out. We got to keep going. All the other tires are on solid ground. So we got to keep going. So, and so she keeps, we get back in, we try it again. And we keep pulling four feet, five feet, six feet, about seven feet. Finally, it comes up, those back tires up and out of the ground. And we are finally... I'll, off that, I thought, whew, that is so good. Now again, we're in this curve, right? And uh, and I said, okay, well, how about if we reconfigure the truck and go backwards? I know it's firm back there, and uh, let's go back there. She said, no, 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 just keep, just go forward, and your trailer will miss that trench because you're in this curve. Go, go forward. She said, just keep going, but don't stop. I said, I've heard that before. And uh, I said, okay, you know better than I do. So I put it in gear. I released the clutch and I went as quickly as I can. And the trailer did miss the trench, but not one, not two, but all three tires on the left side sunk down all the way to the bottom of the trailer. Literally, the bottom of the trailer was touching the ground. It was like a tilty world inside. The refrigerator was on this side and it was going like this. The doors swung open, food falling out on the couch. I mean, my wife would just before was like, can I go in? I said, no, it's unsafe. And uh, man, she looks at it and everything. And, and, uh, and uh, we, try, we try, um, uh, try figuring what we're going to do. She said, what, what, uh, I said, what do you have for insurance? She said, insurance is on you. I'm like, do I have tip over in the church parking lot insurance? You know, I, I don't know. You know? And uh, so I said, wow. She said, we better call a second truck so this thing doesn't tip over. I go, oh, man. Well, the, there's a guy there. He's helping out from the church. I'm supposed to be preaching right now for a youth, youth meeting. And he says, he goes, hey, well, how long is the second truck going to be? About 45 minutes. I don't know, maybe an hour. And he said, okay, well, Brother Miller's supposed to be preaching. He's talking to her. He goes, hey, do you mind if he comes and goes to preach for us for the teens? She goes, no, I don't mind. <laughs> want anybody want to ask me in this conversation here? You know, I didn't feel like preaching. You know, I didn't want to do that. And uh, so I went to preach. I preached on the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. <laughs> and uh, boy, it was it was that I came out and afterwards, and the second truck didn't help. We just had to uh, continue to pull and, uh, and and get that thing up and out. And ah. Oh, 
it was such a mess. And we, we hooked it up and she, she said, well, let's straighten the truck out. She straightened the truck out and then she just kept pulling, went two feet, four feet, six feet, literally digging with those trailer tires, just another trench. And uh, what if I just said, stop, that's it. I, I'm going to take it from here. Uh, you've done what you could, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to put this thing in gear and I'm going to pull myself out of this mess. If I did that, would I make things better or worse? <laughs> I would make it worse. I wouldn't have been able to do it. It would just dig d deeper and deeper and deeper and got the truck stuck again and all of that. You see, the place of grace is where we acknowledge our total weakness in order to access God's sufficient grace. Can I say that again? The place of grace is where we acknowledge our total weakness in order to access God's sufficient grace. God's grace is sufficient. It is enough for us, for everything. For those here that need to trust Christ as Savior, there's no way you can get to heaven on your own. You need to trust Christ and acknowledge your weakness tonight. Those that have already trusted Christ for salvation have been saved. You need to acknowledge that you're weak to live the Christian life. You can't change like you ought to. You can't stop sinning like you ought to. We need to depend upon God for His strength when we acknowledge our weakness. Let's notice four truths about grace tonight. First of all, let's notice this. Grace is God's strength. Grace is God's strength. Now, we say, wait a minute. Grace is God's strength? Uh, look, if you will, at the verse <clears throat> 9. It says this, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, he introduces it as saying, It's my grace that's enough. Okay? And then it says, my strength is made perfect, or the idea is complete in weakness. So he starts with grace, and then he starts talking about strength. He says, most gladly, therefore, I rather, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Skip to verse 10, the last phrase of verse 10. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Folks, he's not, he didn't stop talking about God's grace. He's continuing to talk, talk about God's grace because God's grace is his strength to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Would you acknowledge that? God's strength is, God's grace is his strength to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. There's no way um, <clears throat> I would have the strength to lift this pulpit on my own. There's no way I could have the strength to lift the, the piano on my own. There would be others that would need to help. There's no way we would absolutely be weak uh, to be able to lift some items like that. The truth is God's grace is his strength to do the labor. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10. <clears throat> this is interesting how how it describes what God's grace does. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, it says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Now let's stop right there. Look, if there's anything done in you that's good, it's because of God's grace. I am where I am because of God's grace. I mean, there are many times I thought, man, there's no reason why I shouldn't be an alcoholic totally uh, away from anything of religion or Christianity. Um, I, I shouldn't have any of this. There's so many times I thought I would be the worst of the worst if it wasn't for God's grace. It says this, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. That was interesting. Paul says, I labored more abundantly than they all. But if he stopped there, you would say, wow, yeah. That's talking about the great Apostle Paul. He's so wonderful. He's the best Christian in the New Testament, some people say. Well, yeah, if he, he labored, then there's no way I can do what he did. He says, I labored more than they all, yet not I. But what actually did the laboring? But the grace of God which was with me. You know what this sounds like? It sounds like Galatians 2.20. 
I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We need to access God's grace and his strength to do for us through faith, both for salvation and for Christian living. Number one, grace is God's strength. Number two, grace is only given. Grace is only given. Notice in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, it was bestowed upon me. It was given. If you will, take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians. Go to the right to Ephesians. I really like for everybody to see these next two verses. Uh, these would be highlight verses for the service tonight. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. We're seeing next that grace is only given. The only option for grace is to be given. The basic definition of grace would be unmerited favor. Favor is God's strength doing for you what you can't do for yourself. Unmerited would be the gift part. That would be the free part. Uh, look here in Second, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. Do you have that? The Bible says this: "For by grace are ye saved." That means saved from your sins through faith. Now watch this. And that not of yourselves. It is the, go ahead and say it out loud. It is the what? Gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Wow, there's so much in these verses. So it's by grace that we're saved. How do we get that? It's through faith. It's not of ourselves. God grants to us, gives us, offers us a gift. Like any gift, it has to be received freely. It's purchased by the giver. It's received freely by the recipient. And grace is the same way. He says God's grace and this eternal life is a gift. It is the gift of God given to you. It's a gift freely supplied without any effort. Without any effort. Um, so I was trained as a lifeguard uh, when I was in college and worked in the summer and such for different camps and things. And uh, so uh, I remember two things from my <laughs> lifeguard training. Number one, don't let the drowning person die. This is lifeguard 101. Okay. Number two, I like this one. When saving the drowning victim, don't drown yourself. I like that one a lot. Okay. I said, okay, I'm going to pay attention to that one. So. Um, a lot of people that are well-meaning, very good intentions, they'll jump in to save someone and the person is so frantic, they'll grab onto them, they're thrashing and everything, and they still have so much strength uh, with them that they actually will drown the lifeguard and drown, or the person who's saving them, and drown themselves. And it's, it's really horrific, it's terrible. And so in order to avoid that, they trained us in a couple ways uh, to be able to do this. Um, I need someone to help me. Jonathan, would you mind helping me out? All right. Jonathan, I didn't ask him ahead of time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Jonathan, have you ever drowned before? Okay. No. Okay. I didn't know if you had any experience or anything with it. Okay. So uh, I have you stand right there. And so, and right behind the pole. Hey, in fact, do you have a word you want to preach or anything? No? Okay, all right, I didn't know. Okay, so here's Jonathan. He's going to be the drowning victim. I'm going to be the lifeguard. Okay, just, just throw it out there. I, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but if, uh, if you were drowning, what do you think you'd say to get the lifeguard's attention? Help, help would be excellent. <laughs> uh, it doesn't have to go to a full sentence, just help. You know, that's it. And so if he would call help, and then I, as a lifeguard, would respond, I'd come to him. So why don't you say help? Okay, and as a life, as a drowning victim, he, you're frantic. I mean, you can tell he's frantic, and uh, and uh, th of course thrashing. And if I swim over to this frantic <laughs> uh, drowning victim, as I do so, um, in if if they're still frantic and I'm just going towards the front, especially here's a tall guy right here, uh, he will probably grab onto me. Would you mind just kind of grabbing on my shoulders? So he grabs onto me, and in order to keep him up. The instinct is to push me down, or at least hold on to me, right? And I'm, so I'm going down. He is up above the water. I'm below the water. This is a good short-term plan, okay? It doesn't last long. So I need to come up, and then that means you go down. You know, all right. And then, uh, then I come up, and then we go both like that, and then we both die, okay? And so, so that's the idea. So to avoid this, 
Um, there's a couple of things. One is uh, I could swim around him. So uh, Johnny Bigton calls out, help. I swim around him. Instead of coming up before he can touch me, I swim around him and I come up behind him and then I do a cross chest carry, do a scissor kick. I bring him over to the side of the kiddie pool. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so I could, I could do that. That's one thing. But another, when I'm swimming around, another thing that they could do, you want to just face me? Uh, another thing is when I'm swimming around, sometimes they actually follow you and they, they can pivot. There's enough wherewithal, even though they're drowning, you know, in essence, uh, that they could still face you. And so if I swim up to him this way, again, he could uh, push me down. Okay, so let's face this way. Here's the second thing that they trained us. This is before they had all the extra stuff that they do today. But here's the drowning victim. He calls out. Oh, I jump in. I'm swimming towards him. But before I can get to him I dip down I dive under the water I swim underneath him and I come up behind him you're facing that way you don't know where I'm at <laughs> I come up uh, behind him and then I do the cross chest carry I do a scissor kick and I say no 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 don't thrash don't kick no no I got gotcha. you I do all the work and I get him to shore now watch if he does, if he has any part in the saving process, he will mess it all up. There have been times when uh, a lifeguard will let a large man or someone who still has a lot of strength just sit there and thrash. You say, oh, it's so mean. No, it's for their own good. Because if they try to help in any way, they will mess it all up, most likely kill both of them and losing their lives. Thank you very much. I appreciate your help, Jonathan. Tonight, would you see that grace of God to be saved is only given and it's without any effort. It's without any effort. It's not being earned as well. So this gift is given to you, but you don't give any work in exchange. Remember when the verse said in Ephesians 2, 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. Works in that sense is any good effort, any, any good deed that I would do that I think is going to get me to heaven. I'm going to merit heaven. God will be impressed if I give to the poor. If I go to church um, uh, during a service, a revival service, if I do this, if I help someone else out, then God will help me out, and then I, it'll all work out, right? No, it's not of yourselves. Yeah. It's not of works. So we need to understand, what does the Bible say? Listen, just listen to this verse, 2 Timothy 1, 9. Who hath saved us... <clears throat> And called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. You see, every time grace is mentioned, and if it's accepted, it is given to that person. No one ever earns grace. I remember there was a dear lady, she was in um, Pennsylvania, she was 80 some years of age, never left the state. She was, uh, um, she was in another religion, I'll just say it, she was a Catholic and, and I think pretty devout Catholic lady. She was a sweet lady. She came to one of our revival services like tonight and uh, as at the conclusion, and I'll probably ask it this way, at the conclusion as well when we have a, what's called an invitation at the end, I ask, who here does not know that they're on their way to heaven? Well, that, that night, she raised her hand. And so I said, okay, I'll pray for you. And so I, I prayed for her. I gave the invitation. I invited people to be able to come, talk with the pastor, or come, make a decision. But she didn't make a decision. She didn't talk with anybody. And she left. Well, the next night, she comes back. And uh, she raises her hand again. When I ask who here doesn't know that they're, they're on their way to heaven, she raises her hand. And so I prayed for her and uh, I greeted her as she left, but she didn't talk to anybody and again, uh, didn't trust Christ as Savior. Third night, she comes back again. She comes back and I said, who here does not know they're on their way to heaven? Again, she raised her hand. I prayed for her again. Now, her name was Miss Rose. And, uh, and I said, hey, Miss Rose, um, after the service, I said, I prayed for you. She said, thank you. 
I said, but me praying for you doesn't save you, doesn't take you to heaven. I said, but I would like to share with you some verses how you could know about it because I, I prayed for you each night. Wouldn't you like to know that you're definitely going to heaven and what it means to have eternal life? She said, yes, I would. So another lady and myself sat down. We started in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Well, actually, I went through the gospel, the gospel message of we all have said, very clearly said, yes, I agree. We all are sinners. Okay, here's a tough part. Because of our sin, the wages of our sin is death. The Bible says in Revelation, it says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. So the second, there's a second death, not only physical death, but a spiritual soul death that would be separated from God forever and ever. She said, yes, I agree that there is a hell. She immediately, no problem. Then I went to explain that Jesus, God's Son, left heaven to come to earth, and He died on the cross. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins. She said, yes, He died for our sins. I said, okay, now Miss Rose, what does someone need to do to be able to be saved? Well, you believe in Jesus, and you live a good life. You do good deeds. You know, she kind of went through and explained different things of, you be nice and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I said, no, that's not what the Bible says. It's faith alone in Jesus. She was acknowledging that there is a God and that Jesus died on the cross. And she said, I acknowledge that's true. But she was not depending upon Jesus alone and fully. It was a split trust. She was trusting her good deeds. I said, um, well, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. She did not see it. Now, you've you got to be a good person. I said, okay, how about Titus 3, 5? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. She did not see it. I showed her in the Old Testament. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. She did not see it. I was showing her verse after verse, and I said, Lord, I'm just praying as I'm talking to her. I said, Lord, help. Because she needs to see that she cannot save herself. Then I thought, Romans 4, 5. Romans 4, 5 says, To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I showed her the verse. I said, notice, the Bible says, To him that worketh not, but believeth on him. His faith is counted for righteousness. It doesn't say work a lot or work a little, but works not. Not at all. I said, what if I come over to your house? It was fall in uh, Pennsylvania. The colors were beautiful. I said, if I come over to your house and I rake your, your yard, rake, rake your leaves. She said, that'd be so nice. I said, that's not the point. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, just rake your leaves. Just, just, just an illustration. I rake your leaves in the front yard and your sidewalk, and your drive. And I clear all the leaves, and I take the rake, <clears throat> and I set, them, set it on the brick on your home, on the outside, and I, I go home. I leave. After I leave, will you come out, grab the rake, and start raking the front yard that has no leaves on it? Here she is. She's 80-some. She giggled and said, well, no. I said, how about the drive? Would you rake that? No. How about the sidewalk? Would you rake that? No. I said, why not, Miss Rose? She said, because the work's already... Oh. The work's already done. You mean, when, when Jesus died on the cross, he did everything that was needed for... I don't have to be good. No. You can't be good enough. So then I, I don't, it's not, not doing extra things along. No, it's not. So it's just trusting Jesus? Yes, it's just trusting Jesus. Would you like to do that? Yes, I would. And she placed her faith in Jesus Christ and she was saved. Tonight, you can be saved by placing your faith in Jesus Christ as well. As well. Would you recognize grace is God's strength? Grace is only given. But finally, let's recognize this, that grace is always sufficient. It is always sufficient. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, remember it says right there, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient. 
It is enough. It is always enough. Enough for the problems that you're going through. It's enough to be able to save your soul. And it's enough for the problems that you're going through. What are you going through in your life? Now look, if you've lived any time at all, you realize that life is full of problems. It's one battle, getting through that one to the next one. It's one hill and it's getting over that one. And here's a bigger one. And here's another one that you face. It doesn't matter what your age you're going to go through difficulties. You're either coming out of something, or you're going into something, or you're in the middle of something. Okay? What do you need? God's grace. God's grace is a Christian to be able to help you with these things. It's enough to be able to supply. It, it, think of it this way. Think of it as a, as, as a bank account. <clears throat> a spiritual bank account. And here's this bank account that has God deposited all the grace that you need, all the strength to face your difficulties for the day. It doesn't matter uh, if, it's, uh, if it's infirmities, sickness. It doesn't matter if it's reproach, people are saying bad things about you. It doesn't matter if it's persecutions. If it's distresses, it, the idea of distresses is, man, you're a filled pressed in. It's like the, where the olive is there or the grape and it just squeezes until the juice of the oil comes out. This, oh, all these pressures and all these problems are coming in. God's grace is sufficient. So imagine if I had $1,000 and I said, I want to start a new checking account. I go to the bank. I have my $1,000 cash. I put it in the bank. They say, here's your checking number. Here's your new register that you don't use. And uh, uh, here's everything else that you need. And here's all the paperwork. So I got a new checking account. So I get a debit card with it. And so uh, I go ahead and I pay a bill for $200. We go out to eat and it's $50. $250 spent. Okay, so I check now my checking account, my balance. It shows that the transactions went through. $200 went through. $50 went through. But it shows that even though that went through a couple of days ago, my balance still is $1,000. It's like, oh, that's, that's a problem. What's going on? I give it another day. It's still, those went through that day, three days ago, but the balance is still $1,000. I go to the bank. I said, ma'am, I've got a problem. What's, that, what's your problem, Mr. Miller? Uh, the problem is <clears throat> the, the bank, the, the checking account is not working. What's your number? And you, Okay, look it up. And she, oh, I see. Yeah, you had two transactions. Yes, I did, but there's still $1,000. Okay, let me look into this. Oh, I see what the problem is. You signed up for a sufficient checking account. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> What's that? Well, that means whatever you spend up to $1,000 in your account, that balance, the next day you have that amount back. That was my bad ear. Can you say that again in this ear? Uh, yeah, whatever you spend up to $1,000, you know, that day you can spend $1,000, you'll have the $1,000 the next day. Do you have any problems? Um, no, no. No problems as I back out of the bank. Now, this is, this is obviously made up. If there's a sufficient checking count, <clears throat> all of us tomorrow morning would be there signing up for it, wouldn't we? Could you imagine every day you get $1,000? It doesn't accumulate. You don't get $7,000 and then you have fourteen. dollars But you just you have up to $1,000. If you use it that day, the next day, you have $1,000. Wednesday, you have $1,000. You, you spend $950 on Wednesday. By Thursday, you don't have $50 left. You have $1,000 left. You say, yes, sign me up for that checking account. Okay, now let me ask. Would you go through a whole week and go, oh, I forgot to spend $7,000 this week. And go, man, I don't know what I'm going to do about my bills and about the new car. That No, 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 you wouldn't do that. Would $1,000 a day be sufficient it really should <laughs> it really should would a thousand dollars a day pay the bills and the problems and the difficulties and all the finances yes okay now spiritually when you do not access god's grace through faith it's like you leave the grace in the account well i'll just get it tomorrow no 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 that grace was for monday and even though you, God's grace was there, you fretted and you worried and you were anxious and you were fearful and you were all stressed out. You got irritable 
and you didn't handle it because you didn't think God's grace was enough for you. Would you access and take the withdrawal from God's grace every day? Say, God, it's, it's enough. Notice what it says about grace. God's grace, not shall be. It never says God's grace will be. But it always says God's grace is. It is sufficient. It's what you need today. So are you trying to live life on your own? It's not going to work well. It's not going to work well. If you're trying to go on your own without God, no wonder you're having problems. No wonder you have ulcers. No wonder you can't sleep at night. No wonder you have panic attacks and anxiety. Sure, all those things that have come because you're not accessing God's grace. So tonight, do you need God's grace? We all do. But what do we need God's grace for? First, let me ask, do you need God's grace to save your soul? Realizing I need to be saved. Next, do I need God's grace as a Christian to face the problems and the difficulties? And when I recognize when I'm weak and I have problems, it says, for when I am weak, then am I strong. I would much rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me because God's strength is made perfect, complete in our weakness. It's when I'm weak. Would you trust Christ as your Savior? Will you depend upon God's grace for the difficulties that you're facing right now and say, God, would you help me and give your grace? That night, I came back out after preaching to the teens and the second truck didn't help we we had to get that uh the first truck and we just kept pulling and we dug a trench two four feet six eight ten feet it was incredible it was about eventually 16 or 17 foot long trench it got up and finally out of the ground and when we did it was perfectly level <laughs> There was a, maybe $1,300 worth of damage overall, but it could have been thousands. And the cords reached, the hoses reached. That night, we had four young people trust Christ as Savior. They were saved. The next morning, we had a men's outreach. Eight men trusted Jesus as Savior. That Sunday morning was friend day. Four more trusted Christ. My wife, it wasn't me, but my wife was praying, God, would you, I know you're doing something big because we got stuck in a really big hole. Lord, would you save people? And she asked for 20 people to be saved during that week. And we believe when it's all said and done with all the children as well with her outreach that she did, we had over 20 that trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Do you want to do it again? I'm not real happy about doing it again, but let me tell you, I'd do it again if 20 people got saved. And during that, God taught me something. He put me in the place of grace. Is the place of grace where I feel strong? No. The place of grace is where I acknowledge my total weakness in order to access God's sufficient grace. Would you tonight say, that's what I need. I have to acknowledge my weakness, otherwise I'm not going to get God's grace. Would you tonight trust Christ as your Savior? Would you tonight trust God for the problems in your life as a Christian? With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, let me pray. And we'll begin in a moment what's called the invitation, where we'll invite you to make those decisions. Father, I pray for your help right now. Would you please grant your grace, even in this time of invitation? With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, if you're here and you say, Preacher, I have never, <clears throat> never received God's gift of eternal life. I've never trusted Jesus like you talked about, like that lady needed to do. <clears throat> I've never done that. But I sure want to, and I want to be saved. I want to have God's gift of eternal life, but I've never received it through faith. Is, is that true for you? Is there anyone here who say, I've never received God's gift of eternal life, but I'd like to? Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Is there anyone like that? Would you slip your hand up just right now? And right where you're seated, I'll pray for you. Right where you're seated. So would you pray for me? I need to be saved. That is, have my sins forgiven so I can go to heaven when I, when I pass away. Is there anyone like that? 
Okay, let me ask next. Who here would say, Brother Miller, I know I am definitely going to heaven because I have trusted Jesus and Jesus alone. Not my good works, but I've trusted Jesus alone to save me. And I know he has. He's forgiven me. I know I'm going to heaven. If you know you're going to heaven because of Christ, can you raise your hand throughout the room? I know that for sure. No doubts. I'm going to heaven. God bless you. That's great. You can place your hands down. Now, if you couldn't raise your hand and you don't know about that, that's okay. But I just want to say thank you for being honest. If you don't know for sure about going to heaven, would you allow me to pray for you right where you're seated? Just right where you're seated, like others raise their hand. This time, would you raise your hand asking for prayer with knowing for sure that you're on your way to heaven? If you're here and you say, Preacher, I don't know that I'm on my way to heaven, would you pray for me? Would you, right where you are, would you slip your hand up and let me pray for you? I would love to. Say, I don't know if I died, if I go to heaven, would you slip your hand up? Anyone like that, real quickly? Anyone like that? I don't know for sure that I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to know. Is there anyone that would like prayer for that? Give just a few more moments, or a few seconds. Anyone like that? Let me ask finally, who here would say, Brother Miller, I am saved by God's grace and I thank God for that. And I see salvation as all of God and His grace. But so many times I try to live the Christian life and I've got all kinds of stress and problems and fear and all these other things. And I haven't been accessing God's sufficient grace like I ought to. And I need God's grace for my life right now and I now acknowledge that if that's true for you can you raise your hand all throughout the room God bless you good God bless you and you and you and you and you and you good wonderful I, I just acknowledge I need God's grace for some things I'm going through even right now anyone else anyone else God bless you good there's a number of hands would, would you look this way everyone can look right here it'd be fine in just a moment we're going to stand i'll pray after i pray we'll have the pianist play pastors will be pastor will be here available after i pray would you step out from where you are and, and the reason would be this is we would just take some time to pray on our own about the situation but especially if you're here and you say i like to pray with someone else pastor or his wife would be available to be able to pray with you it's also and most importantly, if you don't know for sure that you're on your way to heaven, would you come and say, hey, I want to know how I can definitely go to heaven. And they would be able to pray with you and show you verses so you can know for sure about that and get it settled tonight. Everyone standing, let's bow for prayer and let's respond to the Lord. Father, thank you for working in our hearts. Help us, Lord, I pray, to be honest and be humble and acknowledge our weakness. And Lord, give us the grace. I pray for each one that raised their hand tonight, those that need to. Lord, I pray that you work in their hearts right now would you do it with their heads bowed with their eyes closed as the pianist plays would you step out and come even right now just to say i need to trust the lord in this area i need god's grace why don't you find a place to pray about that and i encourage you with that god bless you that's great if you need